Again, my name is Carrie Kappel. Um, I'm based at NCS. I'm so happy to be with you all today for this workshop on, on facilitating participatory workshops in preparation for the All Scientists meeting. Um, in uh, the plan for today is that I hopefully uh, introduce you to a set of principles for designing and facilitating participatory workshops. You get introduced to techniques and specific microstructures that you can use to increase participation and engagement. Um, as well as simple techniques for facilitating group decision making and uh, a range of diverse and engaging formats for sharing information. Uh, we're going to um, work together via Zoom today. I wish we were all in the same room, but I, um, I appreciate the virtual platform. If you're able to be video on, um, that would be awesome. It's always nice to see people's faces, but of course, if you need to have your video off at any point, that is totally fine. Um, I do ask you to be muted when you're not talking, just to minimize background noise. Uh, you can use the raise hand icon that's in the reactions at the bottom of Zoom to uh, uh, ask a question or make a comment at any point. You can also use the chat for asking questions and we'll be monitoring that as we go along. And you'll see later I'm going to use another interactive tool uh, where you can post questions as well. This is designed to be really participatory and uh, experiential uh, because that's part of how people learn best. Um, so we'll be mixing it up. And um, I just invite you all to um, really choose to be fully present. Um, for me, that looks like, you know, turning off my phone, min maybe um, minimizing other screens, muting my notifications, taking a deep breath, <laughs> really just settling in to, to being here and giving myself and the people I'm in the room with, the gift of, of presence for the next short period of time we have together. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that you can agree to that first principle. The second principle for, for our working together today is I invite you to really um, listen to um, each other and to me uh, for understanding. And if you don't get it, you know, ask questions and and similarly speak to be understood. So, if, you know, unpacking uh, your assumptions, your jargon and, and calling me on it if I'm using jargon at any point so that we're really deepening our understanding together. And then finally, uh, I invite you to just stay open and curious uh, and committed to learning. That's what we're, we're here for. And that stance, um, I think, makes a lot of things possible. So I'll just put those agreements um, or principles in the chat now and ask if anybody has any additions to that list, any other agreements that you think we need for working together today. Can I get a thumbs up that these agreements will work for it for you? Awesome, great. Real thumbs, virtual thumbs, love it. Okay, so um, the next thing I'm going to share in the chat is a um, is a handout that you can use throughout the session for um, taking notes. It'll also have the prompts and questions and things that we're gonna work with as we go along. And it's got um, resources peppered throughout. So this is really like mini dive into um, facilitation. And there'll be things that I mentioned that I'm gonna you know, go too quickly for you to really fully get it. But hopefully there, you know, I've got links in that document to everything that I'm going to touch on and you can go to those places for more um, for more information. And the way that's set up is it should prompt you to make your own copy when it opens and then you can write in that you can you can write all over it. If anyone's having any troubles with that Google Doc, just let us know in the chat and um, and Gabe or Jen will hopefully help us troubleshoot that. Okay, so first thing I want you to do is go to the second page of that resource guide, and we're just going to spend um, a minute reflecting, reminding yourself uh, of what is the purpose of the workshop that you are planning for the All Scientists meeting, and why are you excited about it? So we're going to do that silently for one minute, 
you can just think about it or if you want to you can jot down notes in that um, resource guide for yourself and i'll just set my timer now i will also put those questions in the chat We have about 15 seconds left. Okay, so now I'm going to invite you into a small group uh, with two other people, and you're going to each have two minutes to share um, you're going to introduce yourself and then just share a little bit about your workshop's purpose and, and its potential, what's got you excited about it. So Gabe, if we're ready, you can let those breakout rooms roll. Well, um, all of that's welcome here. I'm excited to feel your excitement and um, I'm excited to to see how we can um, really unleash that potential together. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna share my screen now and launch some slides. You'll um, have a link to these slides in the resource guide, so you can go back to them at any point. Can everybody see that? Okay, great. Yep. And we're recording again, Marty. Okay, great. Yeah. Excellent. So I think my most important tip for you all, <laughs> it's my first and last lesson, is really to begin with your purpose. And I would say, and your principles in mind as you're designing your workshop. So everything comes back to what are you trying to achieve? In this workshop, one of the things I want to achieve is that it's that it's participatory and you're engaged. So I'm going to use a variety of tools for that. And, and one of those is, um, is Slido, which lets us do interactive polling throughout the, the workshop. So um, if you're interested in playing along, you can join by either um, type going to your web browser and going to slido.com and then entering that number 2643. 786, or you can just hold up your smartphone to the um, QR code there and join our session. And the first thing you should see when you join is a place to put que post questions. I'm going um, to make sure I'm joined as well. If you haven't used a QR code before, uh, just go to the camera on your phone and hold it up to that thing, and there's a little link should show up to open it in your browser. Um, so if you've got a question at any point, you can type it in there. And as a leader in the session, we'll actually go to those questions um, explicitly, but I'll try to keep an eye on it as we're going as well. And I want to start with um, a quick poll here to see um, at the kind of highest level, what your purposes might be for your upcoming workshops. This might be your, your workshop for the all scientists meeting, or it might be some other meeting or convening that you're planning or that you have in mind for the future. So do you wanna use it to tell people to, about your information, plans or expectations? Do you wanna use it to generate buy-in, to get people to get on board with an idea or a tool or to join an effort? Do you want to consult with folks? Are you, do you have something that you want to share and you want to get feedback and insights? Or do you want to 
um, co-create something together? Do you want to work together to shape something new or, or maybe make a decision? Any of these are, are totally acceptable <laughs> um, motivations for uh, bringing people together. So I invite you to, to respond now. You can actually answer more than one if you want. It looks like um, most people uh, are either trying to um, co-create something with their uh, colleagues, consult with them and get feedback, um, or maybe generate buy-in and get them to join something. Uh, although we all, some of us, 20%, also have, um, as part of our motivation, sharing information, telling people about something you've been working on or um, a new insight that you've got, a new, um, a new analysis. Great. So part of what we want to do here today is line up the activities and the design of your workshop so that it meets these goals. And the clearer you are about what you're trying to achieve, the better. So this is what I'm usually designing for in um, the places where I get to show up as a facilitator and a, and a designer. I'm always designing for connection because I really believe that collaborative teams can only move as fast as they build trust among them among themselves so i look for opportunities to connect people i'm also designing for engagement i want people to want to be there and to want to participate and to want to work together moving forward i'm trying to build that coalition of the willing so what's going to get in the way of that and what's going to enable that those are key questions for me I'm also trying to design for creativity and inclusivity because if there's anything I've learned from my years of team science is that I, I don't know where the best ideas are going to come from. They could come from any member of the team. And the more that I am tapping that potential and making space for all those voices, the better. Um, I also, of course, I'm designing for productivity. You know. I and the people I've, I facil facilitate for want results. I also want to really respect and use people's time well. And I'm also looking to the future often in these groups. I, I um, would, I'm trying to seed and support that future coalition of the willing, because I'd like to build this community over time and continue to have ways to work with them. So I'm hoping that some of those resonate with you and might be also um, motivations that you can bring into the design of your all scientists meeting workshop or whatever workshops you're planning. So um, now I want to just invite you all um, with an open ended question to think about what kind of participation you need from your attendees to meet your purpose or purposes in your in your upcoming session that you're thinking about. This could be the quality of their participation, or it could be the, the content of their participation. Like, what do you want them to actually do together? And you can add more than one response here. You have to keep them kind of short, though, so that they. Great. is awesome. I'm seeing um, a lot of people really wanting engagement from their, their audience. They want people to feel and actively share ideas. Um, they're wanting collaboration. Uh, I imagine both maybe in the workshop and beyond the workshop. Um, they want people to participate in a hands-on way, maybe work with data or share data. bring their perspectives. Great, this is awesome. There's a lot of commonality and there are also, there's also a wide range of things that people are trying to do. So a super simple tool that I've linked in your resource guide and that I refer back to over and over again is just this why, what, how, who framework for meeting planning. 
Um, it's just really starting with purpose, getting clear about why you're meeting, whether that's an action or an information oriented um, purpose. And then what do you want to walk away with? What are you trying to achieve? Um, those are your intended outcomes. That should be a short list. Uh, and then what's the what's the process? What's the agenda going to look like to get you there? So what specific flow of activities um, is going to help you meet the objectives and, and deliver on those desired outcomes? And that includes the whole process plan, not just the the time and the you know who's talking when, but um, what technology are we using? Who's on the team? What are the timings? Um, and then the then who is helping is really important. Who's going to who are your participants? What do you know about them and what they want out of this meeting? And then who's on your facilitation team? Who's going to help you? What roles need to be filled in order to um, to make this work? So there's a link in your resource guide to a more um, detailed version of this that you can um, you can use for planning your own meetings. Another high level um, word of advice, uh, I think this particularly applies in the virtual realm, but just as just as much in the real world, uh, a team approach is really going to serve you. So don't try to go it alone. Um, I think at a minimum, you need um, somebody who is going to really facilitate and pay attention to the timing and participation and the sort of quality of the participation and someone who can attend to the content. Um, so I think about like a facilitator and a chair role. This could be two co-facilitators who are trading these these duties back and forth. They're sharing them, but um, but get you know have a team get help. Um, if you're using technology, then ideally you've got somebody who's really assigned to focus on that and support that. You might also want a note taker. You might want to scribe somebody who's um, who's taking notes in a way that the whole group can see. Uh, and you might want um, a reporter or a, a discussant to help draw out um, or synthesize back what you're hearing from your group. Now we want to think about how we really create the conditions to unleash that potential of your workshops that you all were reflecting on earlier and invite the quality participation and engagement that you want to make your workshops as great as you imagine. Uh, but we're going to start by flipping that on its head. Uh, there are all kinds of ways that we can be our worst enemies when it comes to designing workshops that invite participation. So this first exercise is really designed to be seriously fun. Um, so please engage with that, it, it, engage with it in that spirit. And I invite you to, to use your imagination. Anything really goes here. So if you'll flip to page three of your resource guide, I'm going to um, give you a minute to spend some time with the first prompt, which is to make a list of all that you or your team can do to make sure you achieve the worst result imaginable with respect to running a participatory workshop. So really go there. How could you guarantee that you don't get the kind of participation that you want? This is brainstorming, so anything goes, jot it down in your document or on a piece of paper, and you've got one minute to brainstorm that list. I reposted that question in the chat. You've got 30 more seconds. Hopefully behind your, your muted microphones, you're, you're uh, cackling a little bit about all the ways you could sabotage this workshop. Okay, that's your timer. 
So now um, Gabe's going to put us in pairs and uh, invite you to share the things you came up with with your partner. This is really fast. You just have three minutes together. So a minute and a half to share some of the highlights from the things you could do to guarantee that worst possible result. OK, welcome back, everyone. Hopefully that was kind of fun to, to hear some of the ways that uh, others were thinking about um, guaranteeing those worst possible results. Now I want you to think about um, yourself and your team and ask yourself really honestly, is there anything that we're currently doing or we're considering doing as we were planning, as we're thinking about ahead to this workshop that in any way, shape or form resembles the items on that list we just made. And I invite you to really be brutally honest as you make this second list. If you're not planning a workshop right now or you haven't started planning your workshop, you can reflect on other places in your life or your work where in theory you want participation, but you might be doing things that um, end up squelching participation actually. So this is a this is an honest gut check. What am I doing that might be limiting participation in the groups that I'm gathering? So again, you have a, a minute to think about that. You can jot down things in your resource guide. And then we'll go back into our pairs to share some of those. Oh, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you one more question before we go back into our pairs. So think about that one first. Okay, so now um, I want you to think about those items that you just put on your second list and uh, identify a few first steps that will help you stop doing those things. Uh, so go through the items on your second list, decide what first steps will help you stop what you know creates undesirable results with respect to participation. Welcome back, everyone. I know those are really quick. If you are like us, you probably got yoinked back here mid-sentence. Um, but uh, thank you for sharing your your ideas and your um, first steps for towards moving to uh, the participatory goals that you you really want and avoiding those worst possible outcomes. Um, so I'm gonna uh, share my screen again and just talk a little bit more about how I think about creating the conditions for for quality participation. There are a bunch of things that get in the way of participation. And I think you're in your groups, you probably touched on a bunch of these. So we just don't invite it in the first place, right? We, we don't ask for it and therefore we don't get much participation or we don't, we don't leave time for it. We don't um, build it into the way that we work together. We don't set a norm around it. And then we just and we starve the, the time available for actual participation. We tend to default to structures, traditional structures of ways of being together that squash participation. <clears throat> we assume I am definitely guilty of this. We assume that the way that works for us is going to work equally well for everybody else in our group. Uh, and we don't attend to the power dynamics that often um, will put a damper on, on participation of your group members. So how we structure our sessions really matters, um, but we tend to default to a few standard ways or um, what I've come to <clears throat> learn to call microstructures. <coughs> Excuse me. So 
these five are the ones that you'll see over and over again in in meeting structures we uh, we organize ourselves um, in presentations or status reports where everybody goes around and gives an update or a managed discussion where somebody's controlling the discussion and everyone else is invited perhaps to give input or feedback um, a brainstorming session where again the group is not necessarily empowered to use the results of that brainstorming, but they're at least invited to share um, share information in an open ended way or just an open discussion where nobody's in charge and there aren't any clear outcomes and um, it's not clear how the information that comes up is going to be used or what decisions will be made based on that. If we really want to include and unleash everyone, then then we need, and luckily for us, there, there exists a variety of different microstructures that we can use to bring groups of people together. Um, so a few years ago, I got introduced to uh, something called Liberating Structures. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, they have, there's a book. This is the cover of the book. There's also an open source website at liberatingstructures.com. Um, and uh, here they share 33 and counting alternative ways to engage a group. Each of these um, is really designed to include everyone in shaping next steps and to distribute control from the hands of the few to the hands of the group. So here you see those five traditional ways of engaging groups plotted on, um, on a um, conceptual diagram that has the number of people who are included in shaping the, the steps as the x-axis and the control of content as the y-axis. And the liberating structures that, that this group offers are all up in the upper right quadrant where um, control is distributed to the group and everybody has a hand in shaping um, the next steps. So the activity that you just did is called TRIZ, and it's one of these liberating structures. There's the link to it if you want to check it out. And it's also in your resource guide. Um, and the purpose of TRIZ is to really try to clear space for innovation and um, help a group let go of what it knows limits its success, though we may um, often not admit those things, and really invite kind of creative destruction as you then move into um, creating something new. It's got a simple, each of these microstructures has a really simple structure, uh, which is a set of um, five design elements. So there's the invitation. In this case, it was the prompt, those three prompt questions that I asked you one after another. There's the way space is arranged and what materials are needed. Here we arrange space by the breakout groups. Um, and you had your resource guide or the questions posted in the chat as the materials. Participation is distributed equally. Everybody in the group was invited to have an equal voice and an equal contribution to the information. We were configured in pairs and um, the sequence of steps and the time allocation was repeated rounds of, of another little microstructure called um, one, two, all. This is the modified version of one, two, four, all, which is a common teaching technique where you have one minute for individual reflection, two minutes to share in a pair, four minutes for two pairs to come together and share in a group of four. Um, we did a shortened, abbreviated version of that. And then, and then time for insights from the um, exercise to be shared in the whole group. So in the on the Liberating Structures website, you'll see there's a whole menu of these 33 different ways of engaging folks. And um, those design elements are articulated in, in more detail for each of them. And I'll, I'll, I'll refer to a number of different Liberating Structures through the rest of the the training today, because um, this is a toolbox that I use all the time, and there are a bunch of them that I think are could be really relevant to the types of um, uh, sessions that you all are thinking about. Okay, so let's see here. So now I um, I want to uh, just 
give you a tool that you can use to explore the liberating structures. Um, this is something called the Liberating Structures Matchmaker, and it's in your resource guide on, let's see, page five. So it's um it's it's usually a two-sided document. On one side, there's this table that has all these sort of one phrase um, articulations of the purpose of a particular activity. And then on the flip side, those same numbers correspond to the name of the activity. And then you can find the descriptions of all of those on the website. So what I would love to do right now actually is invite you to spend, um, spend a, a couple minutes with the matchmaker uh, on page five and just think about whether any of these um, these little purpose statements line up with the objectives that you have for your workshop do, do any of these resonate with you or seem like they might be useful as you're designing your workshop and then you could just um, note the the numbers of the ones that sound like oh yeah that might that might fit my purpose And while you're doing that, I'm going to check our um, I'm going to check our Q and A. Yeah, I see there's a question about power dynamics. So yeah, I can talk about that in a little bit. Has so everybody found at least one purpose statement here that you think might line up with what you're trying to do or one of the things you're trying to do in your workshop? Okay. If so, I invite you to go to the second page of the matchmaker so that now down to the liberating structures menu, which is on page six of our resource guide and find the name of the corresponding um, liberating structure. And if you're, if you're willing, jump back on to um, Slido and put the name of that liberating structure um, into, the, into the active poll. And see which ones are kind of rising to the top as possibilities for folks. If anybody's having trouble, I realize I'm asking you to go back and forth between a couple different platforms and documents. Uh, if you're getting lost, just feel free to unmute and ask a question or raise your hand. I'm happy to help. Great. Seeing uh, wise crowds, nine wise, use your experience fishbowl. Mind wise, shift and share. Excellent. Yeah, if you've ever um, uh, participated in a um, world cafe kind of process, the um, shift and share is much like that. The idea is that there are um, different people who have particular information to share who are at stations or tables and um, your participants, participants rotate through those different tables and get a chance to have a, it could be a brief presentation or a demo or just a chance to chat with the person at that table and then, and then they shift around and it's a really nice format for rapidly sharing information with a, a big group of people. You can also offer folks the chance to kind of vote with their feet and go where they're interested, which is nice. Um, 
the user experience fishbowl is one that I love for um, as a kind of alternative to a panel discussion. It's a really nice way to invite um, invite a, a, a bigger audience into the expertise of some folks who have deep experience from the field, from um, from their training, from their lives, whatever. And you're you're basically putting those 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 folks, those users in the middle of the fishbowl, and they have a conversation with each other. And everyone else is arranged in a circle around them, and they are invited to um, lob questions in to the fishbowl. But those those users in the middle are really um, the experts, and they're having a conversation that everyone else is witnessing. And it's a really cool format and as an alternative to a panel discussion, which can sometimes be kind of dry. Um, 15% solutions and 2510 crowdsourcing. I'm gonna actually show you an example of those a little bit later. They are two of my favorites for crowdsourcing ideas from a big group of people. Really fun and, and um, especially 2510, super interactive and, and lively. So this is great. There's a, a, I think people are seeing a wide range of liberating structures that might be useful to them and um, and I'll just say that that often what I'm doing as I'm designing a meeting is trying to put together kind of a string of activities. So I might have multiple different objectives I'm trying to achieve over the course of the time together. And I might start with min specs to help a group get really clear on its purpose. Then maybe we use um, wise crowds to invite ideas from, from throughout the group. Maybe we use a user experience fishbowl to get some deep um, perspective from, from experts. And then we go to what, so what, now what, to make sense of what we've heard, draw out implications, and, and come to conclusions about it. So that's, that's how I start to think about um, sort of stringing these things together. And I'll show you, a um, towards the end, I'm going to show you a concrete example of an agenda where I've done that. So I hope that you um, have noted some of those things down for yourself and, and will use this tool as a way to go back to the Liberating Structures website and explore and draw out um, more possibilities for yourself. Everything's really um, pretty well documented there. And it, as I said, it's all open source. So uh, unlike a lot of facilitation resources, this is there for you to use and remix um, under a Creative Commons license as, as, as you wish. Uh, Okay, so I just want to talk briefly about um, principles and practices that can help create the space where people can and want to contribute. And I think this is the place where I will touch on, um, on power dynamics a bit more. So um, as we did, at, as I did at the beginning of this meeting, I think it's really helpful to set your norms for how you want people to participate, have some agreements about that, and then use structures that really um, support those, those principles or norms and, um, and demonstrate that you value people's per participation. It's kind of a walking the talk. Throughout, it's I think it's really helpful to create opportunities for personal connection so that people feel engaged. We are we're we're primates. We like to be social. We like to be together. Um, the, that uh, is easy to to skip over, but it really pays dividends if you create those opportunities for real personal connection during your sessions. You also want to really try to just give yourself enough flexibility to be adaptive. So you can respond to the things that come up on the fly um, and make it a safe space for people to share their ideas and experiences. I'm always trying to democratize participation and really enable everyone to have their voice in the room. There's some structural ways you can do that by mixing up the format. So like I've done today, giving people a chance to reflect silently. Um, to work in breakout groups, to share in plenary. We haven't done that yet. We're such a big group, but we will do that towards the end. Um, a round robin can also be a nice way to, to really level the playing field. So if everybody has to speak as you go, or is invited to speak as you go around the circle, then that can um, balance out some of the power dynamics that lead uh, us to default to giving 
you know, people at later stages or ages of their career, people with more power in the system, um, more voice in a room. So there's structural things you can do. Um, offering different channels for participation is also a, a really nice way to democratize participation. So, you know, inviting people to share feedback and ideas, both verbally or in written ways, formally and informally. Um, let's um, introverts and extroverts, people of different um, uh, kind of power levels in the in the session all participate in ways that they feel comfortable. Uh, you wanna make sure you're tracking who wants to speak. Um, and if there are a lot of people or, or it's a really heated conversation, you might wanna get have a spotter help you. If you're the facilitator, have somebody help you keep track of who's waiting to talk. Um, and then uh, inviting and amplifying and crediting the quieter voices uh, can help set that norm that we really value everyone's participation. What a favorite story of mine is about the um, Obama White House, how the, the women in um, on the staff were really noticing that pretty common dynamic where, you know, a female staffer would offer an idea. There would be a couple of other ideas that would come around. A male staffer would repeat the idea of the female staffer and all of a sudden, it would get traction and he would get the credit for the idea. We've all seen that happen. I see a lot of female heads nodding. Um, it's, it is, it's, it's part of how um, we've all been enculturated. But what they did in the um, Obama White House, these women kind of banded together and said, you know, let's, let's have each other's backs when this happens. Let's amplify each other's voices and um, come in and follow when a woman has a good idea, let's follow it up and say, hey, yeah, Christy, that's an awesome idea. And I want to build on that. Or if the idea, you know, comes, comes around and the, the woman who shared it first wasn't getting credit, they'll circle back and, and make sure that everybody knows, yeah, that was the idea that Tracy added. And, and I agree, let's build on that. Um, anyway, it, they, they talked about how it really changed the culture of how things were working. In, um, in the White House at that time. So this, that's something you can do in your groups. And it doesn't have to just be about women's voices. It could be any, any voices that are um, marginalized within your, um, within your team. Uh, so, and that's really about um, attending to the power dynamics. Um, I try to have a regular practice of noticing where I'm putting my attention in the room because we're all, um, subtly trained to attend to the person who has the most power in the room. And, and so as a facilitator, I'm trying to notice when I'm doing that and then scan and give my time and my eye contact and my listening to all the other folks in the room too, and keep actively doing that and inviting, um, inviting in other voices. Um, and, and going back to these, you know, these proactive structures and formats that help to to really invite everyone to participate and to equalize the, the participation. Okay, so the, the next I'm going to just pause there for a second and see if anybody has any questions or comments so far we've been um, I've just shared a lot of content with you all maybe I'll stop sharing for a minute and see how that's landing. You can feel free to post questions in the Slido or the chat, or just raise your hand or make a comment about anything so far. Yeah, Suzanne. Um, I just have a question about uh, in one of the slides where you talked about the techniques and the one to all technique, that works really well in Zoom. But how does it work in a big room of people? Because it takes so long to mobilize, you know, from your chairs. <laughs> so how totally. do you yeah. do that? Yeah, I'm, I'm really cognizant of that, having recently switched back to doing more in-person meetings after virtual facilitation for the last three years. And yeah, it takes time to move people through space. Um, I think the, the one thing I love to do is to start out with a room design where you've got people in circles to begin with. So if you can use round tables 
uh, with maybe six people, eight people at the max at the table, then you've got a built in breakout group and you can have people reflect silently, then turn to the person next to them and have a pair discussion and then have a discussion at the table level. Um, there's it's not, you know, the the four in that one, two, four all is pretty flexible. So you saw earlier, I skipped it all together. Um, you could have it be six or eight. Uh, you could have it be a triad. So whatever is kind of convenient. Um, if you're in a classroom format, sometimes I'll have people um, work with the pair next to them and then turn around in the seats and work with the pair behind them. But really good to think about it ahead of time and to plan for the time it'll take to move bodies in space. Francisco, did you have a question or a comment? Yeah, no, thank you for, for bringing up all this information. I'm really, really happy. And uh, also seeing a lot of people familiar that I so <laughs> want to say hello to them. Um, Carrie, you mentioned about, we were talking about the power dynamics. Uh, and that was me who posted that question. I don't know if this is a time for you to speak a little bit about that because they're clearly in large groups, particularly uh, we have dominating voices. Uh, sometimes we ourselves may be um, a bit biased towards the people that are more vocal than other people that are more like reflective. So uh, yeah, I, I wanna hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a it's a very common um, bias that we have to be biased towards the people who are um, quickest to say something verbally and most assertive in the way they say it, most comfortable taking up space, particularly verbally. Um, so you know, I, I go I I go back to um, having those multiple channels. So like, I'm a, I want to, I want to harvest ideas from the group, not just verbally. I want to also have ways that people can contribute, you know, in ways that the whole group sees, but in a written format or uh, a visual format. Um, I want to create these conditions for, for small interactions, like the pairs and table level interactions where, um, people might feel more comfortable speaking than they do in the in the large group. Um, and I, I don't know if this is this is the what's underlying your question, but the uh, people are always worry about well, what do I do when that starts happening when I've got one person who's really dominating. Uh, and I um, this is where it's helpful, you know, it's it where you you need to be confident in your um, in your role as facilitator and kind and firm in saying, thanks for your comments. I, I um, now I wanna hear from some other folks. And you may have to do that multiple times with the same person. It might be your PhD advisor. It might be, you know, it might be difficult, but um, I think if you've set principles and norms at the beginning that say, you know, this is a space where we want to hear from everyone, where all voices are welcome, and we really want to tap the wisdom of this whole group, then you can you can point back to that and you can ask people to make space for each other. Um, I also often kind of um, deputize everyone in the group to help um, to um, to monitor whether we're we're living up to the agreements that we made as a group and to invite quieter voices in when um, when somebody's dominating. Of course, I have had those times where I've had to like, you know, pull somebody aside and say, this just isn't productive. I need you to be quiet for the next 30 minutes or whatever. And that, that's hard. Um, but most of the time, the proactive approach of starting with agreements and then designing structures that let people participate in lots of different ways has worked for me and I don't have to do too much of that, giving people the hook. Thanks, Gary. And uh, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but probably a lot of you have heard me say this, but Mural is a great platform to actually democratize space. Um, and for all of you that might be associated with an education um, institution, universities or whatnot, they have um, 
educational licenses. So you have all the all the tools, all the privileges to use, and that, that can be used, uh, you know, remote, hybrid, or even in person, and it gives you the time also to see what's happening with all the comments coming uh, together in form of sticky notes. So if you haven't tried it, uh, some of you have probably been in workshop with me and you know that I use it a lot, uh, but that's another one that helps uh, with all these to, impl to implement some of these uh, liberating spaces or structures. Great, that's an awesome tool, and I I totally agree. I have primarily used it in virtual settings, but you can also use it in in person. And yeah, the tech can be your friend. So think creatively about that. Great. Okay, I have um I have a few more. Uh, the tool was called um, Mural. I'll put the put that in the chat. There's a um there's another one called Miro that's similar and. Confusingly, they sound very much the same, <laughs> um, but they're a virtual collaboration whiteboard tool. Okay, uh, I have a few more um, slides that I want to show, and then I want to give you a um, a little case study of a um, of workshop that I helped design and facilitate to just just illustrate what this might look like. And I'm going to kind of whiz through these because we're getting close to the to the end. Okay, so um, we've talked about principles and purpose, and um, and now I want to I want to get you to think about what kind of thinking do you need people to do during your session. So some of you may have heard me talk about Sam Kaner's diamond model of participation and uh, in the past, so I'm just going to build it up for you kind of quickly. There's a link in your um, resource guide to more information about this, including a blog post that I wrote about a few years ago. So just imagine you've got a session where you have some problem that you want to solve and you've brought a group of people together. You really want them to think creatively and invite um, a diversity of ideas. So you do some things to get them um, thinking creatively and to invite a lot of different perspectives in. And then at the other end, you want, oh, so sorry. So one possible danger is that you, um, you quickly anchor on a, some familiar ideas and you, you just jump to an early conclusion. But instead of that, we really want to keep broadening um the the perspectives and really hearing from everybody in the room and then at some point we're going to want to start to narrow those in and begin to converge and consolidate our thinking refine it and come to a, a, a closure with some solution to our problem you're probably really familiar with the messy middle of this which um sam calls the grown zone because it can be really painful to people um, but it is also the place of real emergent um, thinking. So I think about this diamond model all the time when I'm designing workshops. I think about what kind of um, where we are in this, whether we actually need to get all the way from um, divergence into convergence during the course of the workshop, or maybe we need to do that multiple times on different subjects. Um, and I think about what's going to happen in the grown zone and how I'm going to help people get um, across that transition. And I, um, I'm trying to guard against deciding, anchoring in too early, um, or even worse, never coming to a decision, right? Just continuing to diverge and not being able to agree on anything. And there are a variety of liberating structures that are super useful across the different stages of the diamond model. So I think about min specs or nine whys at the beginning to help clarify purpose. Tris, as we um, use today to kind of clear the decks and invite um, creative destruction. Appreciative in interviews to um, find the strengths that you can build on and really spark positive change. 15% solutions or 2510 to, to sift um, ideas, generate ideas from a, a group of any size. Um, conversation cafe or one, two, four all to rapidly generate and sift ideas um, from everybody to invite all voices to reflect and, and ideate together. Um, wicked questions to explore paradoxes and, and look for both and solutions. 
And um, what, so what, now what, which is a, a favorite of mine, I go back to over and over again to help a group start with the facts and then think about the implications of those facts before finally drawing conclusions about what comes next. So all of those, um, those things on the left um, invite people into divergent thinking using a mix of things, but there's, you know, there's often brainstorming in different formats, verbal or with sticky notes, breakout groups that, that mix up participation and, and allow parallel ideation. So you're getting lots of different conversations happening at the same time. You can use prompts or homework um, before or after the session to get people to think more deeply about a problem. Uh, often the most creative ideas come from, you know, informal interactions outside of the session. So are there ways that you can tap into that? Um, and ways to come at your problem with multi from different angles. And really engage and honor the contributions of a diverse set of thinkers. Um, and sometimes this means setting aside your own expectations about where you think the conversation's going and being more open to how the ideas that you came in with might get shaped and reshaped and remixed um, through the, the course of the session. In terms of getting through that grown zone. Um, here are a few things that can help you. Um, first, really building practices for supportive disagreements. So um, that might look like, um, you know, depersonalizing disagreements and um, giving people, you know, reminding people of how to make um, clear and specific proposals um, for, uh, for their, for consideration by the group, um, really working as a group to clarify what we agree on and, and feel good about, and then where we're having disagreements or we need, we need changes, um, at establishing a set of decision criteria and applying them systematically and deciding how you're going to decide and then having a, a fallback plan for that. There's some tools that might support you in that kind of decision making. Um, a simple two axis matrix is one that I've used over and over again. So if we get a bunch of ideas on the table, can we plot them against how feasible they are versus how, how high an impact would they have? Um, asking groups to do that systematically can be a way to, to really sift and winnow. Um, just being explicit about how you're deciding, you know, are you just asking for input and then you're gonna go off and make a decision or do you need consensus from this group? Are you gonna take a vote? All of that's super helpful to people. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna give you this slide. I'm not, if there's too much detail to go into right now, given the time that we have, but I found this spectrum to be really helpful. The main takeaway from this is that whatever you're, you're, you've decided is how you're gonna decide, it's good to have a fallback plan in case you can't reach a decision during that, the session. Um, this is one of my favorite tools for making decisions with group. It's called Fist to Five. And it's a simple gradient of agreement. So the fist is a veto. Like I disagree with this proposal. I can't support it. Um, five is awesome. I'm all in. I, I might even lead this thing, right? And in between, there are um, there are gradients of agreement. So we could practice it right now. Um, and I'd invite you to think about whether you could use fist to five to quickly pull a group um, in a meeting that you're running. Do you, in this case, um, a five is, yeah, I get, I get this idea. I understand what fist to five is and I could, I could imagine using it. Uh, um, fist is, I, I have no idea what you're talking about lady and, or I would not, I cannot imagine using this. So what do you think? Where are you on the on the scale in between a one, two or a three is like, I still have questions about this fist to five thing. Three, four, three, three. Great. Anybody who's got who's holding up a one, two or a three want to say what their what their question is just unmute and share. Their question. I will carry this. Yeah, is Jen. I only Great. gave it a three because I, in my personal leading of workshops, don't know that we ever have that kind of decision making required, like almost voting on something that just yeah. doesn't, um, 
yeah. So it's not that the, I don't, I think the technique is great. My personal thing is I wouldn't need it that much. Great. Right. I don't make those kind of decisions. Yeah. Another place you can, you could use it in a workshop is just to take the pulse of the group and ask them whether you're ready to move on, right? Just to assess, um, do we, are we clear enough about what we've been talking about that we can move to the next topic? Uh, yeah. Uh, Miguel, did you have a comment or a question? I was just trying to agree and do a five. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. This is one that I found to be actually like it's simple, but it's really helpful. The skill in it for you as a facilitator is to know when the group's ready for a, a fist to five kind of a decision. So um, and that's sort of what Jen was pointing to, too. Like, how often are we making a, a decision like this as a group? That the more that you're working in collaborative teams and you're deciding on action steps together, it might be useful to you to, to um, use a tool like this. Okay, real quick, I just want to um, give you a, a quick story about um, a facilitation that I was privileged to help with um, a couple years ago. And this was here in Santa Barbara um, with a local nonprofit called the Community Environmental Council. They um, engaged us to design a series of climate resilience roundtables with local community leaders and nonprofit partners and elected officials. And um, come on, slides. So these, the purpose of these workshops was to try to frame a community vision for climate resilience and adaptation by identifying actions and strategies that collectively we could we could all take. They were organized around the big threats um, to California due to climate change. They were supposed to be collaborative and participatory. And we were looking at those threats through the lens of, um, of community resilience, of public and mental health, social justice, um, economic impacts, et cetera. So this one um, I'll just highlight for you was on wildfire and smoke. Um, this was actually a, a, like a, a morning session followed by lunch and then some informal networking time. So to give you a sense of how much time it took. Um, we made the event open um, to the broader public to follow along on social media. And then there, as I said, there were about 120 people in the room. We did have formal talks, but just a few of them. We really worked with the steering committee to dial back the number of talks that they wanted to do and just have a few short, um, really engaging speakers. As they were talking, I was drawing at the wall. This is something that I really love to do is the kind of graphic recording to capture the conversation as it's going. And then in between talks, we invited people to reflect on what was happening and to share something of themselves personally. So this was one of the first prompts. Here in Santa Barbara County, you, pretty much everybody's experienced a wildfire and has some personal experience about it. So we asked them to do some storytelling around that in pairs. Um, and here you can see folks engaged in that. Um, everyone was really fully engaged at this point. Um, later in the session, we asked them to, we used one of those liberating structures, 15% solutions to crowdsource ideas that people could do um, right now with their own discretion and, and the resources that they have on hand. And they um, wrote down ideas on the sticky notes, they shared them with a partner and then they shared them at their table level. So here are those happy people participating. Um, then we did um, the 2510 crowdsourcing. So we got everybody up off their feet. We had them brainstorm one big, bold idea um, to help build climate resilience. And then they started moving around the room and meeting each other and exchanging their cards. And every once in a while, I would ring a bell and they would, they would read the idea on the card in their hand and rate it from one to five, Oops, very similar to the first to five scoring. And here they are laughing and, and uh, exchanging their cards. This was very loud and messy, and um, but full of energy. Uh, we also had um, these interspersed, uh, we had a pop-up panel where we invited 
community members who we had identified ahead of time to just get up where they stood in the room and offer a personal story. And it was a really nice um, way to sort of break up the uh, formal form panel format. Um, this is the, that's the graphic capture of the whole um, day's conversation at the end. And then after um, lunch, we had uh, interactive demonstrations. So you could come um, play with data. You could do a virtual reality um, experience to experience um, wildfire or sea level rise. Um, and um, I think, you know, here's those, I, I the, all those things that I just talked through. I'm not gonna belabor those. So, with that, um, I see we've got some questions and we're almost out of time. So apologies for that, but um, uh, I will just take this one that's been upvoted and let you know that you're welcome to add other questions and upvote them in the Slido app. Um, and whatever I don't get to answer here, I will be happy to, um, to follow up and send, email, send an email afterwards with answers. So um, building up a community and action after the workshop, you know, I think setting that expectation in the workshop that that's one of your hopes, that you want this to be ongoing and that you're seeking longer term collaborators um, is your first step. And then your second step is really um, inviting that the quality of participation in the workshop that's going to make people excited about collaborating, that like deepening that coalition of the willing follow it, articulating what are the clear next steps for how they can stay engaged and um, how they can contribute, and then following through on that, being sure to communicate at quickly after the meeting about those next steps and, and, um, and yeah, supporting people in, in continuing to connect with each other and continuing to work together. Um, yeah, I mean, it, there is always the um, this question about uh, how to ask people to take on more work. Of of course, um, if it's going to be voluntary, then it's invitational. So, what I always try to think about is um, how can I, if I need people to volunteer, how can I align what I'm asking for with what they need and how they are going to be incentivized or rewarded in their day job. So. You know, if they're a PhD student, what what matters to them might be opportunities to um, collaborate with established scientists or to publish papers. So can I can I align the work with that? Um, other people might be really looking for ways to learn new things. Can I offer um, those kind of opportunities? I'm gonna stop. Well, I'm gonna just. This last slide just really sums up um, what I'm hoping you took away from the workshop, which is that uh, best practice is really to begin uh, with purpose and principles, be super clear about those from the outset, create the conditions, which include the norms and the structures for quality participation, mix it up, share information in a lot of different ways, design those activities to support the kind of thinking you need at different stages of your process, um, help your group to make decisions in explicit ways with clear proposals, clear criteria and methods for inviting their input and, and close well, which is what we were just touching on. Reflect back what you, um, what you heard, offer them some clear next steps, follow through on those and, and give them ways to stay connected. With that, I will stop sharing and thank you all so much for um, your time and your participation, all your great questions and your input. Do feel free to continue to uh, um, add questions to the Slido app and I will, I will, I will answer them and send them back out. And Marty, I apologize, we did not end up with time for questions about ASM. How would you like folks to follow up with you if they have questions about the All Scientists meeting? Yeah, that's fine. I think people people know they can email me directly with questions about the ASM. I do wanna just put in a plug for SCED, which is the 
uh, the meeting app, which allows you as a workshop organizer to communicate directly with everybody who's signed up for your workshop. Um, so if you want to send out materials ahead of time or, uh, or follow up, um, please take advantage of that. You just need to go to the workshop and if you're signed into SCED, it will give you a, um, a place to do that. Uh, other workshop questions, give me a shout. And thank you guys for showing up so much. And thank you, Carrie, it was great. Um, oh, really my pleasure. Really, uh, really fun. fun. And we will send you a, um, a quick after workshop survey. I really appreciate your feedback. I, I take it to heart and use it to make future trainings better. And I know the LTR network also, office also feels the same way. So please, um, if you get that survey, take a few minutes to fill it out. Thanks everybody. Have a great week. Good luck with your upcoming workshops. Thanks very Thank much. You, Gary. Thank Thanks, you. Gary. Bye.